Good morning, this is Pastor Barbara, a.k.a. Preacher with Parents. Uh, today is the 26th of June of 2016, Sunday morning. We were continuing in chronological order the events of end time prophecy. I don't know that I have the two computers set up exactly the way I want them. Just a second, we'll try. Um, we have um, a live group on iVlog for our Bible study, and we're making a recording for Preacher with Paris on YouTube. We started, and it's my intention to each time I go to another step or another, another run on the ladder of end time prophecy to mention some of what we've already done. Hopefully, it will cause us to remember more details. We've been studying for a while now. On Wednesday nights, the restoration of the temple and Jerusalem following the 70 years of um, time that Israel was captive to King Nebuchadnezzar of Babylon, which today is known as Iraq. It's, it's taken us a long time because we're studying out of the chronological Bible, at least six months, probably closer to nine months to move through this section chronologically because so many different prophets wrote about it at the same time. So that makes many people saying basically the same thing, but because they said it more or less at the same time and we're teaching chronologically, we're gonna to get to all of it together. We had some general things to consider. Even though we didn't live, let's say, a thousand years ago, two thousand years ago, we could have eliminated certain periods of time in history when we would have said this is not end time prophecy. We knew that we could not consider ourselves anywhere near end time prophecy until Israel was in her own land controlling it. And that didn't happen until 1948. And this is 2016. So basically, my lifetime, I was a sophomore in Bible college when that happened. So that could not have happened during my grandfather's time or even my parents' time. So that puts it Rather recently, the Bible and all the prophets talk about wars, things that will happen in Israel, and hey, they can't happen in Israel if there is no Israel. We knew 
get end time prophecy. Prophecy has been fulfilled uh, for years since the book of Genesis. But we could have eliminated many periods of time that were not part of end time prophecy because there were some things that had to happen first. We had to be in a time of a great deal of people moving around from place to place and there being a great deal of knowledge. Do you realize how long we went without a bicycle, an automobile, an airplane, outer space travel? That all happened within a couple of hundred years. So all of that time that preceded that, we had to eliminate as that was not end time prophecy. But we do have people not only traveling from place to place, but many kinds of travel. You know, what kind of travel is bothering people who live in the mountains where I live now? Those little drone things that you can get for a hundred, two hundred dollars and put them in the air. Now, they bothered celebrities for quite a bit of time because photographers use them to try to get onto people's property when they can't physically do it because dogs and um, uh, people working for them in security don't let them on and they can't do it through long distance cameras but um, a couple of years ago, we had some bad fires here on the mountain. And we were trying to get control of them. And we lost several loads of fire retardant materials on helicopters because those drones were trying to get closer and get better pictures. So while drones flying around in the air are not of great importance, they are some because they are being used to get to leaders of terrorist organizations in their homes. And it's, it's amazing how you can be someplace else and giving directions to this little drone and it's making a right turn on such and such a street and a left turn and it's going in a window and it's going down the hallway and it's going into somebody's office and it's um, uh, taking their life. It is, it's amazing. Those things would not have happened um, even 300 years ago. So we know that we are very definitely within the period of end time prophecy. Like I said, prophecy is being fulfilled. Um, I was looking for something. I'll show it to you at another time. But I have something that I had lost for a long time and I just uh, recovered it. And it has to do with prophecy being fulfilled, and it has to do with the book of Genesis. So prophecy has been given and fulfilled for a long time. We're talking about end time prophecy. All right, so we know that we have to have people moving around the world um, easily making contact and going from place to place as they do. Uh, 
we know that a number of countries are involved in end time prophecy. So we know we're getting close. Aside from these general clues, like more earthquakes than ever before, and more of this, that, and the other than ever before, aside from that, the very first thing we're looking forward to to say we are in or we are near end time prophecy. Hi, Sweet Tea. Good to see you. Um, I haven't seen you for a while, and I miss you when I, when I don't see you. Um, so we know we're in that general time. The big thing that we're looking forward to, and um, I had a movie sitting around here called Left Behind that I was considering showing this morning, and I don't have it, so I won't hold it up and show it to you, but that is um, a movie about the rapture, sometimes referred to as the resurrection of Christians or of saints. That is the first thing that will happen that we can all say, oh, we are now in end time prophecy. And that is that in a split second, all Christians, all born again believers, are immediately taken out of this earth. Those that have passed away and are buried will rise first. Jesus, along with thousands of angels, blowing trumpets, singing praises, will be in the air, in the clouds. They will not come to earth. And if you're a, a preacher and preach a lot of funerals, this is material you go over a lot. Those who have died in Christ go first, and then those that remain go with him. That happens instantaneously. We've seen one or two movies about the rapture. Things that probably happen, probably going to be automobile accidents, because probably some of the people who will go in the air to meet the Lord will be Christians, and there'll be nobody driving their cars, and the same thing will happen with airplanes and other modes of travel. And so there are many books, many prophetic novels, meaning we don't guarantee things will happen this way, but they probably will be very similar. And we've talked about that quite a bit. The next thing, and we've already mentioned this too, but the next thing that happens, happens almost immediately. And that's, and it sort of happens at the rapture that we make a distinction between those that are born again and those that aren't, those that are saved and those that aren't. One of the problems we have, because we have a number of Old Testament prophets talking about the various things that are going to happen in end time prophecy. And then we have the Lord answering certain questions. Uh, some of the disciples and the Apostle Paul answering questions and teaching about these things. And then we have in the book of Revelation the story that uh, 
God gives and an angel assists, the only living disciple and apostle, John, the beloved, who had been the youngest of the disciples, they've all gone. They've all been martyred. He's the only one that well, he was suffering for his faith, and he was exiled on an island as opposed to being put in prison. He was not really in jail, but he was suffering for his faith. And we have that prophecy, that information now. We've been given to it, and we've been given. It's been given to us in many different places by many different people, and in many different ways. It'll say, "Oh, there were three animals, and they looked like this. They had so many heads. They had so many horns. They were doing weird, weird things." We have so much information coming to us over a period of so many years in so many forms. Some people, in the case of Daniel, dream to dream. Uh, somebody else would see a vision. And so much information was given to many people over a long period of time, and we know it's all future. But it's like when you get out your coin purse. And I'm sure you all do this. When you get five to ten dollars in change in your purse, you got to start spending it. And I'm either just having finished spending it or I'm in the process of spending it. And there you are. You start out with the quarters, right? Because four of them makes a dollar. And you can pay a five dollar bill real quick if you've got a pocket full of change. And so there you are with the quarters. And then you've got the nickels and you've got the dimes and you can, and you've got the pennies. And you've got all this stuff together. And you want a certain amount of money. And now you start having to pull your quarters from here. Have you ever done that? Put your quarters at a certain part of your purse and your dimes in another part of your purse? Because then if you want to start getting rid of your change, you can do it much quicker that way. Well, this is how, this is the situation we have. We have all this information. Oh, we have animals that look like this. They got many heads, they got many horns. They do a lot of weird things and they represent different countries doing certain things, but when? And so that takes a little while. Was Ezekiel talking about the restoration of the temple and the city of Jerusalem? Or was he talking about the rapture? Was he talking about people from Iraq going back to Israel? Or was he talking about pre-1948 Jews from every nation on earth gathering in Israel and making it Israel again? That's the studying we have to do. The information has been in this book for a few thousand years. And we do, and the closer we get to the end times, the more we understand it. It's a little harder for people a thousand years ago to understand what an airplane was. Therefore, understanding wars was more difficult. Understanding countries that might be called by the name of the leader or by the name of what they used to call the country 3,000 years ago or what they call it now, we're getting better at that. What we're working at now is getting all of these things we know that are going to happen, getting them in the order that they're going to happen. So 
after the rapture, it's already been determined. Some are going and some are staying. So that particular determination has been made. Those that have gone in the rapture are no longer here on earth. Will never be and never have been judged on a matter of sin on their life. That's taken care of at Calvary. Once sin is forgiven, it's forgiven. And we're trusting that people that get saved stay safe. We have in the book of Revelation 24 beings, sometimes referred to as creatures or animals. I like the word beings or creatures. We know that happens early on after the rapture because John has a picture of them bowing down, taking off the crowns from their heads, which they have just received and offering these crowns to Christ as a gift. We know they're Christians because they're in heaven. And we know they have not yet entered the period of the bride and the groom and the wedding feast. And Christians are never judged on their sin. If it's been pardoned, it's been pardoned. So the idea of their having crowns means that the occasion in which we are rewarded for what we do with the opportunities Christ gives us to do something for him. We know that it came at that time and they were given those crowns. Then the next thing which happens because believers will not be around for all of the things we have studied and we're all but the last three chapters we've studied in Revelation. We'll go over it again, but we have gone over it all except for three chapters at least once. So the next thing that happens, and that's what I'm trying to do today, is get these things that we know are going to happen in the order in which they happen. The next thing that happens is the wedding feast of the Lamb. The Lamb is the Lamb of God, the Lord Jesus. He is the groom. We have to get our eyes off the days when we all have a Bank of America card and a checkbook. And Mama stayed home with the kids because it didn't take two incomes to run a household. And we go to the old-fashioned wedding, the kind they had in the Old and New Testament. The bride's job 
was to keep herself pure. That was her father's job. And it's still being done in the Mideast. I talk to people from time to time, and if I feel that it's okay to talk to them about personal things, I usually inquire, and I know that in the Mideast, um, this practice still goes on. The practice during the wedding feast, in which the bride and the groom meet, not in the exact presence of their guests, but in the general area, and her virginity or purity is proved. Some more modern women nowadays don't like it. I talked to somebody whose husband wanted to parade around the white cloth to prove that she had been kept pure. The deal is made anytime after she's six to eight years old between the father and the groom. It's his job to take care of her. And he has to prepare for a home. And this is why 10 to 15 years difference in age is common for the men to be older. The women, if they're going to be homemakers, Although there's nothing wrong with them having a university education, it's not required. They're able in their mid-teens to keep in a house, to have children, to care for children. But they are to, and their father and mother's job is to keep them pure. The groom's job is to go and prepare a house. John 14 said, my father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you, but where I go, I will take you with me. And this is what Jesus has been doing as the bridegroom, preparing a heavenly home for us. And we, who become members of the Bride of Christ when our sins are forgiven, and we become believers, Christians, followers of Christ. And so the next of the various things that happen It's such a tendency to say during the seven years, and it's so incorrect, because as we're going to see today and next week, it's much longer than seven years. We've got a period of time of seven years called the seven-year tribulation. But things don't start an hour after the rapture, and they don't end an hour before Jesus' second coming on a white horse in Jerusalem. There's a lot of time in between. So right after the rapture, the Christians who have earned a crown have been given a crown. They're in a home which the bridegroom has prepared for them. And they take the one thing that they have of value, and that's the crown which they were just given. 
as a reward for having used their time and energy and so forth in God's work. And they take that crown off and offer it to him. Then, and I need to reach over here, uh, put this Bible here, so I have access to something I have here on my lap. And let's go back to Well, here we have the judgment of Christians, which follows the rapture. Because right away, they either go to spend a period of years with Christ and um, The crown of glory has been given to them. And they win a race of temperance and self-control. They have been fighting while they've been living in the world, dealing with temptation, and keeping themselves pure. And now we have the marriage of the Lamb. And the bridegroom who promised to take care of the bride and the bride who, along with her father, made a promise to keep herself pure. It kind of amazes me. I mean, you never know when you turn your television on and you have a program on and that program ends, what program's going to come on next? And I see the beginning of, of, of programs like they're going to have a wedding and the night before the wedding, the groom, uh, the best man, is giving the groom a big party. And it's one last night on the town. No accent. This stuff has not been going on. It shouldn't be going on. It isn't like have a ball, do whatever you want. You got a right to do everything at least once. Most rooms are proud to be marrying a bride who hasn't done at least everything at least once. But she has kept herself pure. And all of her experiences and all of his, it works both ways, are with each other. So now Christ comes and the marriage feast is celebrated and that goes on for a period of time. And I think possibly in the past I may have said seven years because I have fallen for this seven year period of time that really does not discuss all of the time from the rapture to the second coming of Christ. The actual marriage takes place in heaven after the church has been raptured and before the second coming. The second coming does not take place until just before Jesus' thousand year rule and reign on earth begins. Um, 
um, let me read a couple of things and mention some scripture. It takes place after the judgment seat of Messiah, when it's been determined who's a Christian and who isn't. The bride is dressed beautifully, fine linen, and all of her glory, dazzling garments, such as been described as angels wearing before. And he comes with the armies of angels from heaven. The marriage supper of the Lamb takes place on earth during a period that ends with the starts with a rapture and ends before we hear anything at all about the Antichrist. Now, we're going to talk about, you've heard about Gog, Magog, Tubal, wars, blood running on the street. Uh, the Euphrates River drying up because of an earthquake and armies marching on foot from the general area of China. Where do we get all that stuff? Ezekiel in chapters 36 and 37. Now it's 38 where we get the prophecy of the Jews having come from every part of the world. To Israel. It's that prophecy where he's out, he sees a lot of bones. Bones are pieces of what used to be living bodies that are former dead body parts. He sees them come together. This is Israel coming to together after not existing. This is not their going from Iraq or Babylon back to Jerusalem and building the temple and building the wall, which we're studying on Wednesday night. What Ezekiel is talking about is Jews coming, and this is in chapter 38, Jews coming from every part of the world back to Israel. And this happened in 1948. There was a plan, and it worked for many years to get rid of the Jews. There were people who were Jews only because they were descendants of Jews, not because they came from a place called Judah. And this land is going to be invaded by people from other countries. Now, it isn't too hard to figure out because they had maps in those days and we got maps now. Water, is, uh, I live by a lake and uh, a few years ago 
and we had a drought. And um, we had land between the walk that goes around part of the lake that we call the village and the actual water. And the boat that takes people a couple of times a day uh, on a trip around the lake, they were using a little dinghy to get to the boat. Well, of course, it's we've gotten rain, we've got snow. Things have improved. And now we have water, except in one place, that comes clear up to the walkway. But aside from losing a couple of feet of lake water, the lakes are where the lakes have always been. The rivers are where the rivers have always been. It isn't hard. In some cases, some countries still have the same name. Israel is still Israel. Egypt is still Egypt. Libya is still Libya. What used to be um, Babylon is now Iraq. What used to be Persian is now Iran. Syria is still Syria. But what used to be Moab and Edom is now Jordan. So we can kind of figure out when it tells us places where these places are. Maps haven't changed. Um, in order for there to be an attack of many nations on Israel. There has to be Israel, and they have to be pretty much running their own country and pretty much be like every other country, which they weren't until before 1948. It says they will move against the land of unwalled villages. So they're not, well, they do have some problems with Palestinians and others. And we do get things in the news. It isn't as though they're behind walls in order to protect themselves. So Israel is living carefully. I mean, we're careful. I never would have thought of ISIS in San Bernardino. San Bernardino is at the bottom of this mountain. If I drive out to the road and drive from the road to the highway, walk out to the end and jump off, I travel from 6,000 feet to a few hundred, and I'm in San Bernardino. Never would have thought. I mean, Los Angeles, yes. New York, yes. Houston, even Chicago. But San Bernardino, and then Orlando. Um, the Hebrew prophet talking about a peace treaty between Israel and the rest of the, of the Mideast is talking about, as I said, the 38th chapter of Ezekiel. 
and I'm calling it the Russian Iranian Hotel. Um, this is an attack that will be made on Israel. And it will be made by people from more than one nation. It makes it rather easy for us to figure out where, where we need to be careful of. Because as I said, some countries are called by the same name. Libya is Libya, Egypt is Egypt, Israel is Israel, Syria is Syria. Damascus is the largest, largest city that is still going on for a longer period of time than any other city. It's over 2,000 years old. Some of the people will come from what used to be Babylon. That's in the area of Iran, uh, um, Iraq. Some will come from Russia. There are some names like Rosh that had been around for a really long time. And they will be around in the future. And we know the name that they used to be called. So we know that Russia, and then Russia, if you look at a map, and especially if you look at a globe, it covers most of the top area of the globe. It's very big. So parts of Russia, that huge country, are going to take part on an attack on Israel, which you know the other day I wanted to show you Israel on a map. And the only way I could show you the surrounding countries and still show you Israel on the same map, because Israel is like so small, was to put it on my cell phone, let you see the general picture of surrounding countries, and then enlarge it until we could finally find Israel. That huge nation will be one of the nations that will come to Israel, a country you can drive across between breakfast and lunch, such a small country. Um, That information comes from Ezekiel 38. So we will have people from Persia, Iran, and from Russia. Among other nations, but coming onto Israel. Um, Israel is secure, it's confident. Along with, and, and let me go back to, uh, to something I refer to often when we're talking about different periods in history. And that's the image that King Nebuchadnezzar had in a dream. And it was the image of a person and the head was gold and that represented Babylon, which at that time was the greatest and the most outstanding nation on earth. It was followed by the next world kingdom of the Medes and the Persians, represented by silver. And it was followed by the next kingdom, 
which you know, was a short one at the beginning of the Greeks and Alexander the Great did all he did in a period of 10 plus years. Then we get to Rome. And that's represented by the legs, which are iron. This is a lot easier for me to understand than when we're talking about some of these representations that are like animals. An animal with ten heads and so many horns and I'm supposed to look at this and figure out what country it's talking about and what they're going to be doing. But when we get to the Roman Empire, we get to something that's different than all of the other empires that are depicted on this image. The Babylonian Empire existed at the time of the dream about it, and it ended a few hours after the handwriting on the wall, and the Medes and the Persians came in. So that's taken care of. That's all past history. We're studying, or we did recently on Wednesday nights, the fall of Babylon and the rise of the Persian government and King Cyrus, Cyrus II, gives them money, gives them back property that he takes from Babylon, who had taken it from Israel. Babylon is still there, but the king of Persia is running it. Because we are now in the second kingdom. We then get on to Greek. And a hundred or so years before the birth of Christ, that world power fizzles out, and the Roman government becomes the strongest world government. The Roman government continues to be a world power for a few centuries. They're in power during the birth of Christ. Remember the kings that came from the east and said, we come to see who this king that is born, where he is, so we can worship him. They had to go to a Roman authority because Rome was in charge of Israel and most of the world at that time. Christ, at the time his murder was being planned, was being planned by the Jewish religious leaders who were being outdone and outshined by him. But they could only do it with the help of the Roman government. They didn't have power to take somebody's life. If they could slap somebody around, they could hit them 39 times um, with a, a nasty instrument. But they couldn't put them to death, so they needed the help of the Roman government. So the Roman government was the power From the time the Greeks fizzled out before the birth of Christ and lasted for a couple of centuries. What happened to world government since then? There are none. What country is the world government? It's not the U.S. of A. 
it appeared as though the United European group might like to salvage the old plan. None of them, no one country could manage it on their own, but if they all got together and until Thursday, there were 28 countries. I brought it up Wednesday night because I didn't know how it would come out. But we know that before we get through talking about prophecy, we're going to be talking about a world government made up of 10 countries. And I remember 30 years ago when prophecy preachers started talking. I, every time another country came into the uh, European Union or the European market, there were new sermons about it. And then I remember when they got past 10, then it wasn't looking so much like what the Bible was talking about anymore. But like I said, there are things. We don't need to get excited and upset. We just look. We keep them in mind. And as I was telling somebody, and as I told you a couple years ago, when we were watching out of the four occasions when they had the red or blood moons, that it was worth considering. First of all, anything that has almost never happened and is going to happen four times in two years, it's worth taking a look at. You don't have to change your religion. You don't have to change what version of the Bible you're reading. Just look it over. Keep it in mind. See where it's going. But let me tell you, any country, in any any situation like these four uh, eclipses that happen to come on the feast days of a Jewish holiday, and, and those feast days were picked by God. The Jews didn't pick the day. And something that almost never happened, now it's going to happen four times in a year, and in each case it's going to be twice on the Feast of Passover and twice on the Feast of Tabernacles. It's worth looking about. It's worth thinking about. One of the two... Uh, who preached and explained this more than anybody else. He didn't get this idea. He called NASA. And he says, is there something going to happen? Is there anything you can educate me about? And he said, yeah, we've had something happen three times. And it's going to happen in a two-year period before time is coming up, and then it's not going to happen again. Yeah, look at it. Think about it. Don't go crazy. Don't change religions. Don't go nuts. But don't say, hey, there's nothing to it either. Keep it in mind. We have had no world power. Ah, but people have been talking about a world power. Now, what world power would that be? We, we'd love to think it's the United States, wouldn't we? Well, we know that at the rate we're going day after tomorrow, we won't be able to afford it. What? What power? could be so great that it could rule the world. Well, there's 
one. Big enough to rule the world? And what power would that be? The one world order. No country on, on its own is strong enough militarily, strong enough monetarily, strong enough in any way. But if you could get a great power by putting a lot of smaller powers together, wouldn't that work? Well, a lot of people were hoping it would work. And we're looking at countries that are going to get together. And Russia is one of them. What are the other ones? Some of them were given by name. Tubal, Gomer, are countries that are in what is now called Turkey. I was in Turkey in 1967 after I was in Israel following the Six Day War. And present day Turkey is like nothing to do with historic Turkey, but it's there. So naturally, I perk up when an airplane is shot down on the border of Turkey and Syria. Those are countries that are mentioned from time to time, not in a big way, but in some way in end time prophecy. So of the attacks against Israel, we have the former Roman Empire made up of two distinct kinds of people. Let me name some countries. Group one, Rome, Greece, Europe, Libya, Egypt, Turkey. What am I naming? I'm naming all the countries that are north of the Mediterranean and immediately south of the Mediterranean. The plane that was shot down, and I think it was a couple of days ago, that an American plane was able to find that plane that left Europe and was on its way to Egypt and landed in the Mediterranean less than 100 miles short of the border. We're talking about Europe. Now, when I say Europe, and I say Mideast, I don't think the same thing to you. I, I have a, a, um, a dress, an outfit that I wore to a special event a week ago Saturday. It was made in France. It was a size 35. <laughs> um, Very distinct. I don't think of 
pay rack when I think of France. When I think of Rome and the Vatican and the Seven Hills, I don't think of the Arab Emirates. In my mind, Europe is one thing and the Mideast is another. But in that image of Babylon, Medes and Persia, Greeks, and then Roman Empire, we have the Eastern Roman Empire, which are our Mid-Eastern countries, like Iran, Iraq, um, Yemen, some of those countries. I have no problem in my mind. It's my mind that has a problem. I have no problem lumping them together. And I have no problem lumping London and Paris and Frankfurt and Spain and Portugal, lumping all them together. You put them together and you have the old Roman Empire. Now, I don't, maybe I can find it real quick here in my cell phone. Sometimes when I don't use the cell phone for a while, I have to do stuff to it. Um, See if I can bring the gallery up here. I might be able to find it here. I've got a map. Let me bring this up. Here are Some of those countries, you don't have any trouble up here, even though you don't see the word Russia, you know it's up there. You see here all the countries of Europe and over on the other side of what we think of as the Mideast. Now I'm looking for the picture of the image. And I should be getting to it pretty soon. A lot of pictures. Here we go. Look at this. Look at Rome. Legs of iron. Look at the feet, iron and clay. The divided nations of Western Europe. What was the Roman Empire? Is represented by iron legs. The difference between in the 490 years, um, those periods of seven, 
the difference is in the Roman government that we're going to see in the future. We're calling it that because it will be a revival of what we have in the past. We have the same places. But instead of iron, which is strong, that old Roman Empire was strong. Now is a combination of iron and clay. And it falls apart for two reasons. It falls apart because clay and iron don't mix. You pour a cup of coffee on something made out of clay and the heat of the coffee will melt whatever that thing made of clay is. And then the second part of it is that in the prophetic part, the part which hasn't happened to the revised Roman Empire yet, we've got more than just the iron and iron and clay. We've got a stone not made with human hands coming down out of a mountain. It hits the feet. And with the feet that go first, the rest of the statue, the rest of the history, the rest of the past, of all those empires that have ruled the world in the past and will in the present, they go down nothing because that rock, not made by human beings, not any kind of machinery, not any kind of invention, something that only God controls, will come down and everything else will be past tense. And God will have perfect control over what is going to happen. So now we're going to have The next things we can expect after the rapture and then briefly after the saints have been rewarded and given crowns. Long before we're talking yet about an antichrist, we got some countries coming together they are coming in part from Europe and the western part and in part from countries that we would consider mid-eastern and there will eventually be a leader of the revived or the new Roman Empire. There, this invasion, long before we get to 666, long before we get to who is Antichrist, some people think somebody's going to pop up the morning after the the, the, the um, rapture and say, hey, I'm in charge of the world now. It's not going to happen that way. 
and there's news going around on YouTube. If you go to YouTube, type in end time prophecy, wait for it to open up, you'll see a bunch of prophecy preachers. And you'll see that in some of them, most of them, somebody has messed it up and says that on August 30th of 2016, and we're on June 26th, so we've got two months and four days. We're all going to know who the Antichrist is. I don't think so. There's going to be some things happen. And after these things happen, there will be a person, and I'll give you probably next Sunday morning, or maybe even before that, because with the book of Revelation on Sunday nights and, and the restoration and the same prophets that are talking about this, talking about the restoration of Israel, with it all being together, we probably will maybe even tonight mention some things again. Maybe it would be good to try to get more of this stuff said already so that we have a, a better idea of the big picture. But long before we have a clue who the Antichrist is, now I can tell you who it's not. There are some people because of their religion, we can exclude them. There are other people because of where they're from, we can exclude them. So there are some we can exclude, we can't exclude everybody. But when somebody steps forward, one person steps forward and makes a deal with Israel for seven years, that is the Antichrist. We know that immediately they start building a temple because we know that he breaks his deal of seven years after three and a half. And part of his breaking of the deal has to do with he do what he does in the temple. So when we get to how we know it's not going to be a Jew, uh, we'll get to that. But we don't, the only really clue is not so much where they're from or where they're not from. But the main clue will be somebody. Now, undoubtedly, Israel is going to believe that it's Messiah. First of all, they don't want anybody else building the temple other than a Jew. And many of the religious Jews are going to think that even though this person doesn't claim to be Messiah, he probably is. And we'll talk about who it is and isn't, but the only clue as to who is not is because all of a sudden we now find out that we've got a president that is more um, Mid-Eastern in his religious beliefs than he was Church of Christ in Chicago with Reverend Jeremiah. It's it's not that simple. We do have a clue. Antichrist, first thing we know about him, he makes a deal. And the deal is for seven years. He breaks it, but you won't know. You won't know until three and a half years is up that he broke it. But you will know immediately when he makes a deal with Israel, an individual, 
that that's him. And then when they start building the temple, you're 99% sure. And then when he puts his own image in the Holy of Holies and does a few other things, you know for sure. But all of this guessing, there is no reliable clue. And before we get there, we've got this invasion of these other countries to deal with. And I'm looking to see if we can get um, Um, let's talk about who some of these countries are. Rush is talking about Russia. Russia is the Far East. Let, let me talk about California. Alaska is far north of California. Oregon is north of California. But Alaska is far north of California. Now when we're talking about Russia, we're talking about a country that is far north of Israel. Just look on a map. But immediately north of Israel is what is now Turkey, but we know it by a number of names of places that are in what is now Turkey. Magog, uh, Uzbekistan, Turkmenistan, Tajikistan, and some parts of, of Afghanistan are in what is now considered Turkey. Nishek and Tubal are in modern Turkey. And then Persia became Iran in 1935. I'm older than that. and also part of Iran, and I'm not older than that. Ethiopia, what is part of modern day Libya? That's where this thing with Hillary and the war and Did somebody start something with a, a stupid video, or was it really a terrorist attack? And Gomer, that's part of modern-day Turkey. And it might be a little bit of Armenia and Azerbaijan. So people from any or old of these nations will get together and invade a country that you can have breakfast in one side of it and drive over and have lunch on the other side. These countries have never had anything to do with each other in the past. They didn't make any sense in the days of the prophet Ezekiel. All of these countries in the eastern portion are now Islamic. And in the western portion, which is Europe, are becoming Islamic. I played you a, a little video, uh, and I will possibly again on Wednesday or sometime 
I think it's such a cute song. I, I, I enjoy listening to it, and it reminds me a great deal of the U.S. of A. We're talking Muslim. When Ezekiel had received this prophecy, there were no Muslims. Yet, there was no United States of America. But then he wasn't talking about the United States of America. Why was there no Muslims? Muslims were started by a fellow by the name of Muhammad. Muhammad wasn't around at the time of Jesus. And the whole calendar is before Christ and after Christ. Now they're changing it. They're calling it the Common Era. But it's actually at the birth of Christ. All this that we're studying about the restoration and going back and the New Testament. When the New Testament begins, it's at the birth of Christ. Everything in the Old Testament is not only in a different testament, but it's a different time concept altogether. There were no Muslims until there was Muhammad. Now, he didn't come around for several centuries. And yet, on the eastern portion, representing the, the one leg of iron, it's nearly all Muslim. And the other is the invasion or the perceived invasion by many Europeans of the Muslims. This happens in the latter years. Um, and all of these countries that I mentioned, what did I do? Mention 15? Israel. And they're all against one country that is so little you can drive through it in half a day if you're going in, um, east and west. In half a day. All those countries. And Israel stands alone. But there is the wall, the one wall that comes down and hits the feet. The feet break apart, and when they do, the legs break apart. The stomach comes apart, the chest comes apart, the head drops off. The whole past becomes nothing because now God is in control. Um, I want to see where we're a good um, stopping off place is. I don't know how much detailed information to give you about the invasion of these other countries. I know you've heard about them. Uh, I don't know that in order to understand prophecy, we have to understand the details of all of these countries. I don't think so. But I think I found a good stopping off place, and it's about 15 minutes before the time that I normally end. And that will make this video about an hour and a half video, which is quite long, but if you seriously want to understand this topic, it's not that long. All these people from all these places come to this little tiny place. And we've got bodies to bury. What? 
Yeah. We have to account for all the things that are going to happen between the rapture, when the saints go to meet Christ in the air, and the second coming, when things get so bad in Israel that God has to personally step in and Jesus comes riding in on a white horse. Everything in between there. God steps in. That's the rock. That just says to everybody else and everything else, look, that's enough. Now, with all these people, from all these places, I'm going to stop right here. And, you know, I usually make a little mark where I stop. Israel. Little, tiny Israel that God is taking care of. And by virtue of the fact he's taking care of them, he's taking care of us. Because we are grafted in. Israel is God's country. They got roots. They got a country. Christians don't have a country. Jews were given a country. They got it back now. Christians don't. But some of the promises God made Israel are for Israel only. They have nothing to do with non-Jews. But in some of God's blessings, we are grafted in. And I told you, man, I've told you many times about my friend Vicente that used to do grafting. He'd come with a tree. He had he had a tree. It was five trees in one. Because over here, he cut off a branch and he grafted another one and it grew together. And while up here had no roots, it was part of this and this had roots. So some of these promises are for us too because we have been grafted. And I think I'm going to, this is a, a good place for me to stop. And when I come back, I will be at the end of, because I'm not going to go into much more detail, on the war of the invasion of all of these countries, both from the area of Russia and the area of Turkey. But there's going to be a lot of dead people. And it doesn't make any difference how modern and how advanced you are. It takes a certain length of time to clean up after a war. And that's the next thing that's going to happen. We haven't even gotten to Antichrist yet. We haven't gotten to his making a deal yet. We're not even counting time yet. Because time doesn't start until Antichrist makes a deal with Israel. So we got quite a bit in front of us. Let me close on video for now. We've got a, just about 100 and almost... Uh, an hour and 35 minutes and um, we'll be back probably with another video unless I decide to go out to the lake tonight and to do tonight's broadcast from there uh, we will probably have another video for tonight but in the meantime blessings on you